Welcome to All About Boston. I'm Seth McCoy. We are five days away from the elections on Tuesday, September 24th. We are still talking about uh, the mayoral elections and also the at-large city council races. Um, tonight, my guest is James Sutherland, a PhD student from Northeastern. You may be wondering why I'm having a PhD student from Northeastern come onto the program. But James uh, has written a couple of pieces about Boston voting, uh, trends that they're seeing, along with Larry DeCara, who, if you're familiar at all with Boston politics, you'll know that Larry goes way back. He was a Boston city councilor. He also ran for mayor. But we're not really here to talk about Larry DeCara and his uh, distinguished career. We're here to talk to James about what you think might happen next Tuesday. I mean, it's, it's really anyone's game. Um... Every indication I've seen out there, it's there's six, seven, eight candidates that could finish in the final. Yeah, and that's the interesting thing. We keep seeing all these polls that are coming out, and this one's on top, and this one's gaining steam. But really, because the margin of error is so great, and also we talked off camera a little bit about who's being asked, who you know who they're going to vote for. It really is anybody's game. It could wind up completely flip flopped. It just we have no idea. Uh, I mean, absolutely. Um, you look at when the polls were done, and there's been endorsements that have come out since. I know a lot of John Barrow supporters have talked about how um, polls show that he might be slipping, but that those were done before he was endorsed by the Globe. Um, but also who they are targeting in these polls, because right. I know the Globe's poll, the, um, about 38% of the respondents earn over $100,000, and that's just not... It doesn't resemble the Boston that I right. know, the Boston that actually exists. Right. And then you mentioned the margin of error as well. Um, yeah. A lot of these margin of errors, around 4%, so statistically tied um, yeah. going into this. Yeah, it's really, um, you mentioned the Boston Globe endorsement. They endorsed John Conley and John Barrows. For somebody like John Barrows, this is a huge win because there are some people in the city who live and die by the Boston Globe, especially their endorsements, and are going to look at that, and they may have been leaning towards another candidate, and now they see, okay, well, they're endorsing John Barrows and John Connolly. I did like John Barrows when I spoke to him. Maybe that's where the vote's going to go. Do you think a lot of that's going to happen based on the, that endorsement and other endorsements that we're seeing? I mean, I'm not sure if it will act, uh, actually convince voters to vote for him, but it will give them a chance to uh, give him another look. Mm -hmm. um, he, he has an impressive record, and I think if the Globe is going to endorse him, that, that means something to voters. Right. And whether or not you agree with his policy, it's, it's worth another shot. Right, absolutely. You and Larry wrote an article for Commonwealth Magazine called Where the Votes Are, basically about where people vote in Boston. <laughs> what were some of the things that you found while you were doing the research for that article? Absolutely. Um, our major sort of finding on that was that Boston has a bifurcated electorate. Um, there's voters that turn out every two years, every year almost, because we have an election every November, um, that no matter what is on the ballot, they will go out and vote. Whereas we have a bunch I'm of... I'm one of those, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I vote well. every, every I election. I am as well. Um, but then on the flip side, you have voters that only come out every four years mm -hmm. for the presidential election. So in um, this past election, 255,000 uh, voters in Boston came out to vote. Mm -hmm. um, the last mayoral race, it was 110. Right. So there's a huge discrepancy in who votes. And sort of what we are talking about is, is younger, um, more educated, more liberal people that come from outside the city like myself mm -hmm. um, that have chosen to call Boston their home are sort of sitting out most of these elections. Why do we think that is? I mean, it's, it's, that's frustrating to me. It's something I talk about with basically every guest that comes on this, this program is we have all of these people who live in the city, work in the city, um, who just don't pay attention to the local politics, which is probably the most important ones to be paying attention to. Of course, it's important to vote for the president. It's important to vote for the governor. But when it comes down to it, the nuts and bolts of the city happens here at the city, so we should be paying attention to the people who are running for mayor, who are running for city council, whether it's at large or district seats, mm -hmm. and people just don't. I mean, they should be. Yeah. Um, over the past probably two decades, we've seen a huge devolution of power from the federal government to states and local governments. Mm -hmm. um, it's made it even more and more important. And local government is closest to the people. Right. Um, it's the politicians you see out, out in the field every single day. Mm -hmm. um, why they don't vote in these elections, I honestly, I think they have other things going on. Um, 
they're finishing school, they're starting families, they are, um, they've just moved here, they don't know anything about the political scene. Voter fatigue too, we've had so many special elections over the last couple of years, people are probably sick and tired of getting robocalls, they're sick and tired of going home to their mailbox and finding a piece of mail from this candidate and that candidate, um, which obviously plays into it as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, we've had, I can't even count how many elections this year. Yeah. There's been a lot of talk too about having the city council um, go into a four-year term, so that we're not having two year, you know, every two years you're voting for somebody here in Boston, which I think not only saves money because mm -hmm. elections are expensive to put on, but also would help I think get people more engaged because then you know you're only going to that well every four years as opposed to every two years. I I, I agree. I think a four-year term would be beneficial. Um, it cuts down on the time that candidates are running for a re-election. Yeah. Um, they can be doing their actual jobs more. Right. Um, whether or not I'd like to see all the turnover at once or if it's staggered every two years, it's something I'm not sure on. But I also think that we should be coupling these elections with the federal elections to increase right. turnout. Right, absolutely, because, I mean, again, it saves money and also it helps drive up voter participation, mm -hmm. which is a huge thing. Um, so have you been surprised at any of the things that you've been seeing or hearing um, during this mayor's race? Or are there people um, or candidates who are, um, maybe you didn't, I don't want to say that you didn't put much weight into them, but that's how I'm going to say it. So that now you're like, wow, I'm giving that person a second chance or this person has really impressed me. Anything like that? Um, I think definitely John Barros. Um, coming into this, he had very little name recognition outside mm -hmm. of the Dudley neighborhood. And he, he's really, He's been a dominant force in this, I think, and I wouldn't be surprised if he became BRA chair or if he ran for mayor in four years. Right, absolutely. Or superintendent, he could yeah. become part of somebody's administration if yeah, he doesn't make it surprised. to the final. Um, one thing that we talked about off camera was that there are several um, different opportunities on Boston.com <laughs> to play around with the mayor's race, and one of them is the mayoral adventure game. Did yeah. you, you play the game? I did play the game. So for people at home who don't know what this is, if you went on to boston.com, you could uh, go down to where they're highlighting the mayor's race, and there's actually a game that you can take, uh, I think you'll see on your screen right now, there's a game that you can take the subway, you can take the red line, the orange line, blue line, green line, silver line, to different parts of the city, and it will give you an opportunity to pick different things that might uh, shed some light on who you might support in the mayor's race. I don't know how accurate it is. I took it several mm -hmm. times last night. Uh, frankly, it didn't line up quite with, uh, with some things that I was thinking about, but I don't know how you found it, James. Um, I, thought it, I thought it was great. Um, it's pretty simplistic, but it, it does its job. It's a tool of political socialization. We see new media, we see Instagram, Twitter. This is just sort of another way to get candidates out there. Um, it's media sponsored, so you know it's going to be unbiased. Um, and, and I think it's just another effort to drive turnout up and get people interested right. in whatever way possible. Well, is that something that's shocking to you, is that we're trying to create this sort of buzz around this, this election? And certainly after having the same mayor for mm -hmm. 20 years, people should be excited about going next Tuesday, September 24th, <laughs> to the <laughs> polls and, and actually deciding um, what the next you know steps are for the future of Boston. I mean, this is going to be a transformative election right. in the city. Well, yeah, not only just for the mayor's race, but also for the at-large yeah. race, because we have obviously several councilors who are leaving uh, at-large and district, yep. because Rob Consalvo is obviously a district councilor. So we're going to have a whole just new face of Boston city government, which somebody was talking to me the, the other day about the fact that Mayor Menino is a very strong mayor, uh, the council over the years has certainly diminished in its strength mm -hmm. and power, and having a new mayor come in with a lot of new councilors might either equal that balance out um, or tilt it so that the council is a little more stronger than the incoming mayor. Do you think there's any way that would happen that the, this next body on the city council mm -hmm. will be able to get a little more powerful, if you will? I mean, I think it could happen. We would have to change the city charter. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's interesting with, I think, five city council, um, city ca current sitting uh, city councilors running, if one of them gets elected to the mayor, they know what it's like on the other side. Right. Um, what it's like to have a strong mayor in a weak 
right. uh, council system. And I'd be curious to see if any of them would support this. Yeah. Well, it also could be uh, detrimental to the next mayor to actually give up some of that power that mm -hmm. is now in that seat because who knows what's going to happen, how long that this next person will be in office. One of my theories, and I don't know if I'm correct, <laughs> obviously, because I do not look into the future, but I've thought for since Mayor Menino announced that he wasn't going to run for re-election that we could actually have sort of that, um, you know, a mayor for just one term. It's sort of like the rebound mayor, if you will, mm -hmm. how people have rebound girlfriends or boyfriends. You might have a rebound mayor. Somebody's going to be elected um, in November, come in. People aren't going to be satisfied with that person for whatever reason. And then four years from now, we'll see another change. I mean, that's, that's absolutely possible. Um, you have to give Mayor Menino credit. He is everywhere at once, it seems like. Even when he um, has been in the hospital, he's been dying to get out on the streets. Mm -hmm. um, and if the next mayor doesn't do that, if he's not at every ribbon cutting, if he's not at every um, sort of community event, people are going to turn on him, right. him or her. Right. Um, and, and I think that's critical because Mayor Menino has set the bar very high. Yeah. You just mentioned that you brought up a good point in your comment there. You said him or her. We only have one woman running for mayor. Are you shocked that there weren't other women who stepped up to say, I'm going to run for mayor this time? I mean, I'm shocked in a way. Um, there's plenty of um, female candidates that could have done it. Mm -hmm. um, I think we do have sort of a pipeline issue in the city of getting female politicians um, into office. That happens uh, across the Commonwealth, by the way, not, and across the country, really, because um, it's a lot more difficult for women to stand up and run for a, a variety of different reasons, um, and certainly that happens here in Boston as well. Yeah, and Massachusetts has actually one of the worst records for getting females into state and local politics. Right, which is surprising since we're supposed to be very progressive and liberal, mm -hmm. um, but we still are unable to promote women to you know that level of comfort where you know they're out there and they're asking for money, and I think that's part of the issue. It's difficult to ask for money. I also think it's difficult for women to put themselves out there, especially maybe not so much on a city race, mm -hmm. but as you get into higher offices, uh, the scrutiny yeah. into your personal life and just everything else, people just don't want to deal with it. Absolute, Women don't want to deal with absolutely. it, I should say. Absolutely. And if you're, if you're a younger female, you have this expectation to have a family, yep. to have these duties in the home, but that's, that's not the case anymore. Right. Um, it, and I feel like we can definitely uh, benefit from having more females. Yeah. Um, I know in the state house right now, we only have one African-American woman. Right. And the entire delegation is uh, right here, Rep, uh, Gloria Fox. Right. Um, so I, I do think we need to promote female candidates a little bit more, and um, they're just as strong as men in right. politics. So Yeah, I also think, too, that, and I can say this because I'm a woman, <laughs> um, women, we tend to sit back and say, oh, I don't know, am I right for that role? Whereas a man would just say, of course I'm going to run. I can do this job, no problem. So we have to work on changing how women view themselves and how we can contribute to society and obviously become elected officials. Absolutely. So. Um, I think the statistics, something like women need seven people to tell them to run for office right. before they actually do. And they have, a def they have a different legislative style. They're more collaborative than men are. Um, they're more willing to uh, negotiate, work out compromises, and they're not as stubborn, honestly. <laughs> we can be stubborn, but not all <laughs> the time. But you're right. Yeah, I think um, women do work in a collaborative effort, and we're we're a little bit more open to receiving other input and not mm -hmm. just thinking that our own is the best, which is great that we're talking about this because we have a, a, another elected official coming on the show, Representative O'Flaherty. So he might have some thoughts as to uh, how collaborative he works and uh, how women should vote. So, I mean, not vote, but, you know, <laughs> women, sh women should vote, but they should also run for office and, uh, you know, get out there and get ahead of the, the curve. But um, so... Any predictions for Tuesday? I know I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm going to. We've obviously talked about the polling, but do you personally have any predictions as to how things might turn out? Um, well, back in April when we wrote this article, um, we were talking about how municipal elections, there's a traditional voter base um, in West Roxbury, Hyde Park, um, coastal Dorchester, just to name a few parts. and. This sort of new Boston, these younger, white, more liberal voters are all living downtown. Mm -hmm. And so we said that if some candidate can mobilize these sort of absent voters from these elections, 
it'd be a formidable force, but I haven't seen that happen. Um, I think this is going to be a traditional sort of municipal election. Um, I see if anyone sort of safely getting in, I see John Connolly getting into the final. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I think it's a total crapshoot. It's going to be really fast. Do you think the numbers are still going to be the same as last time? Uh, I think you said 155,000. Um, so 255,000 for the, the presidential race in 2012. The last mayoral race was 111,000. I think the preliminary itself could hit 120, potentially, mm -hmm. um, with just all this sort of action. And I think the magic number for any candidate would be 20,000 votes to get into the final. We'll see if they get that. It's going to be, I mean, anything can come into play with the weather. I don't know. I haven't looked yeah. ahead to see what the weather's going to be next Tuesday, but that's <laughs> going to be an, an issue. Um, and obviously how people mobilize their bases. Yep. And then because there are so many undecideds, we're going to have people who are going to the polls potentially who are literally just going to walk in the booth and look down the list or look halfway down the list or just yep. look at the first name and check that right off. So it's just going to be... It's so interesting to sit back and watch, and I'm, I'm very excited. I can't wait. <laughs> and we're going to be here, of course, on election night doing uh, election night coverage, so definitely tune in for that. And um, I just want to thank you for being here tonight and talk about the election. And I'm looking forward to voting, and I know you are too. Absolutely. And I definitely will have you back on the program. Sounds great. All right, so we're going to be right back with Representative Jean O'Flaherty. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to All About Boston. I'm Seth McCoy. If you're just tuning in, we are talking about the mayor's race and a little bit about the at-large race, which of course, September 24th, which is five days away, is when you should go to the polls and vote for who you want to be the next mayor and of course for city council at large and if it applies for district city councilors. If you have a question for me or for my next guest, Representative Jean O'Flaherty, you should call us here at 617-708-3290. One final plug before we talk, uh, start talking to the representative. We do put the videos from the show on uh, YouTube and also on the All About Boston Facebook page. So if you've missed any episode and you want to learn a little bit more about the different candidates, definitely go on to the YouTube page or the Facebook page and watch. And again, go vote on September 24th, which is next Tuesday. Representative, welcome to the show. This is your very first time here, so I want to give you the warmest welcome possible that I can from behind the desk, of course, but it's nice to have you here. Yes, always nice to be met with a smile, and you have a wonderful staff here. Thank you. I know that everybody here is so great, and it's yes. a, a nice crew. So, And they made me these, I didn't get to show these off in the last segment, but they made me these fancy new cards to make it almost look like um, we're like big time you, or something. You are. I so. had a chance to hang out a little while and uh, very hip. Uh, right. You know. We we'll play some good music in Absolutely. between. We had it's some Beatles going. We need to work on that. We need some Bon Jovi, maybe some some Guns N' Roses, but <laughs> we're we're uh, we're making it work. Yes. So we're going to talk a little bit about the mayor's race. You, um, I'm going to start you off by saying that you're here in support of a particular candidate, but we're going to talk about the race as a whole. Sure. So do you want to start off about who you're supporting and why? Yes, uh, very quickly, my dear friend Marty Walsh was elected uh, the same year that I was. Mm -hmm. uh, we both started as uh, colleagues in the legislature, uh, he representing obviously Dorchester and myself, uh, the Charlestown neighborhood here in Boston. Uh, the two of us, uh, as, along with Jack Harr from South Boston, we all uh, started as freshman legislators together, mm -hmm. uh, quickly became friends, and uh, because we were part of the Boston delegation, uh, worked quite a bit together. and. Uh, came from similar backgrounds and uh, we had a lot of fun together. I've been through a lot of battles together <laughs> um, and clearly uh, Marty is somebody that I have uh, watched uh, just grow tremendously as an elected official um, and work on some incredible and diverse issues. Mm -hmm. um, and when he called me and said he was running for mayor, something that I know um, he has been thinking about for quite some time, uh, I was very, very excited for him personally, um, professionally as a colleague, yeah. but more importantly, uh, personally as a friend. Were you surprised at how many people actually got into this race? We have a field now of 12 candidates on the ballot for next Tuesday. Were you surprised at that? No, I don't think so. I think uh, obviously Boston has not had an election in quite a long time for mayor. Uh, I think it's very good for the city uh, to have the eclectic group that uh, has decided to put their name on the ballot. It takes a lot of courage mm -hmm. uh, to put your name on a ballot, to be willing to put your family uh, through what some would describe as the trauma of a campaign. Uh, some may say 
uh, that it's a, a marathon, whatever the definition or however they, they seek to uh, describe it themselves, we know that it is quite a bit to take on. Okay. Uh, but I think it's very good for the city. I think uh, we have a very, very qualified pool of candidates. I think all of them bring uh, great skills, have brought some great ideas mm -hmm. uh, to the table, and I think the city will benefit from that. Whoever uh, ends up becoming the mayor, I think, themselves, they've probably learned quite a bit on the campaign trail as well. Yeah, it's also hard with having so many candidates for each of them to be able to get their message out there, which is why it's good that there are people like you. Last week we had Representative Moran, Representative Enriquez, Senator Petroselli, and Representative Michael Witz here yes. talking about obviously the campaigns and um, the race. And do you find that it's easier, this is kind of a silly question, but do you find it's easier for you to go out there and, and be pushing for Marty Walsh as, as opposed to him trying to be every place all the time? Well, he has a very busy schedule. I will tell you, for everybody that's working for Marty Walsh, he is easily himself individually outworking any single <laughs> member of his campaign staff. He is putting in 16 to 18 hour days. Um, I know that, um, as I said, he's, he's out very early in the morning. He's home very late at night. Uh, but I, I, I think that um, there's uh, a lot of folks that when they decided to get into this race knew that that's what uh, they would be undertaking. So um, it's very easy for me when it comes to Marty because of my personal relationship, what I've witnessed him do in the legislature, the issues that I have worked on uh, with him that are a very diverse range of issues. Um, just watching uh, and, and listening and, and hearing and, and just hit the way he describes his vision for what he wants to do, mm -hmm. I'm very excited and it's very easy for me to talk on his behalf. What are some of the things that he's done that you're most proud of that you can you sit back and, and think to yourself, oh, I wish I had done that, but... Yeah, well, not uh, maybe what I would have done, mm -hmm. but uh, in terms of his uh, willingness, for example, uh, to take on an issue that was very difficult and required a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, I, I suppose calmness is the best word to use when you're in a negotiating room. But Marty was appointed a very important position by our speaker to chair uh, the public construction contract reform issues. And as a person with his uh, union background, I think the speaker understood in appointing Marty to that position that he was probably going to have to compromise on some things that he would hold very dear because of the background that he brings mm -hmm. into the legislature. Um, Marty learned, I think, in that process and taught others um, what it is uh, to compromise. The Associated uh, Contractors of Massachusetts, which is not a notorious pro-union organization, um, commended Marty Walsh for his work on that uh, panel mm -hmm. uh, for the work he did on behalf of the House and for what ended up becoming the law and ended up becoming public construction reform. And that was signed by Governor Romney. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, for me to hear Marty oftentimes characterized as sort of a one-dimensional candidate serving with him for the years that I have, working with him on an issue right. such as that, but far more broad than that, Marty worked for years to have uh, a national background check for anybody that works with children here in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm very difficult to become law because there were so many pieces uh, to that puzzle. But uh, nonetheless, he uh, burrowed in and uh, was very diligent about it. And I'm very proud to say that Governor Patrick signed that uh, for Marty. He wasn't able to be there because he was out <laughs> campaigning. Uh, but now here in Massachusetts, not only in Boston, but across the Commonwealth, right. uh, that law is in place. And I've, I've witnessed him work on those eclectic issues. And that's why uh, it's important for me, I think, to say that uh, he is far more than uh, the one-dimensional well, candidate. And, and you bring up a good point, because that obviously is what people point to when they're talking about Marty Walsh, is the union connection. And that some people are uneasy with that connection. but. Uh, clearly you see a different side of him where you see it's more than just fighting for the unions, it's also, you know, doing stuff for kids or other things that are important to people, especially here in the city, yes. as they're looking for who the next leader of the city will be. Exactly. I think the beauty of the legislature and one thing that uh, I've enjoyed tremendously uh, about the legislature is you have 160 members in the House that each bring with them a very eclectic background. Uh, they come into the House, uh, some being small business owners, some being lawyers like myself, and we're not all lawyers, by the way. Uh, <laughs> That's what people think, some, though. <laughs> some nurses. Uh, we had a doctor. We had a psychologist. Uh, so when you uh, discuss an issue such as uh, education or you talk about public safety, you uh, are serving with individuals that are former police officers. Uh, we had a former judge, uh, very interesting background. So 
I think what is important for the public to know is that for the last 16, uh, in our 17th year, um, Marty Walsh has been exposed uh, to a whole host of different issues that have impacted this Commonwealth. Everything from economic development to education, all those important issues, and has a record uh, to show where he stands on those issues and the productive work that has been done on behalf of the city of Boston. It's something that uh, is very easy for me to talk about because I have literally stood side by side with him on a lot of these issues and have worked with him as long as I've told you. Absolutely. Um, there are some serious issues, though, facing the next mayor, economic development, Boston Public Schools. Um, where does Marty stand on public schools, for example? Does he support lifting the charter school cap? Uh, or does he think we should just focus on fixing the, the public schools? Sure. Uh, for anybody that wants to know anything more about him, they can go to MartyWalsh.org and they can, uh, at their own leisure and at their own pace, they can examine his positions on education. Uh, being a legislative colleague of his as long, I think it's fair for me to say with some accuracy that Marty does support charter schools. Uh, he was on the board of a neighborhood charter school. Uh, for years. Uh, another ironic twist to uh, his characterization of being sort of uh, a one-dimensional candidate focused on unions. I think that that's been uh, a difficult position for him, but uh, nonetheless, uh, Marty, I think, in his own uh, wisdom himself, uh, decided that he would support charter schools because of what he saw happening in his own representative district and how he felt uh, offering that choice to parents was important. I share the same view. Uh, I've always supported charter schools and lifting the cap, and uh, I know that uh, Marty is wise enough to know that once you become the CEO of the city of Boston and you have all of a sudden underneath you the responsibility of running the schools, uh, that no decision will be made rashly. Uh, he will bring some very smart uh, people, uh, I imagine, from all over the country and probably all over uh, the world at this point, given the, uh, the international hub we are for ideas and the like. Um, and I think what you'll see is a great team around him that will uh, challenge uh, folks to think uh, about those issues, uh, to think creatively, and uh, I think he will uh, obviously look outside the box in dealing with some of these issues. Nobody has a magic wand, uh, right. but one thing you'll get with Marty Walsh is a work ethic, and mm -hmm. he'll have some very, uh, I think, clever and uh, capable people around him to help. Yeah, it's going to definitely be a, an interesting time to see what the next mayor does, whoever that person may be. Uh, when James was here, we were talking about the fact that there's only one woman in the race. Is that something that surprises you? Um, not necessarily. I think that uh, we're at uh, a stage, I believe, in politics where uh, women, I think, are slowly but surely making the entry uh, more and more. Uh, we have some candidates that are running uh, in the 5th Congressional, for example. Uh, there's a couple of women there, Senator Clark and uh, Senator Spilker are involved in that race. So I think slowly but surely um, we're moving in that direction. And I think uh, women are uh, today as inclined to say, you know, I'm going to take a look at that and then obviously make a decision. Right. Uh, Martha Coakley recently made her decision to re-enter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, not re-enter, but, uh, <laughs> but run you know, again. to get back in campaign mode, I guess, yeah. is the best way to say it. And I'm very excited for her yeah. uh, in doing that. I think we're going to have a great... Uh, demo internal democratic debate for governor and yeah. we'll come up with the best candidate that's good for our party and right. I think the best candidate uh, will emerge and the people will decide. Um, so it's an exciting time. It's, I mean that's one of the things I've been talking about for months now which it's, it's shocking to me that we're finally at the finish line if you will for the mayor's race. Well when you said large. five days I actually got a little nervous <laughs> um, because I'm thinking of all the phone calls that need right. to be made and all the work yeah. and uh, it's uh, it's it's quite a task. Well yeah I mean for somebody like you basically starting tomorrow through Tuesday night you're going to be not focused on whatever you normally would do on the weekend but you're just going to be focused in on getting your candidate to that next round. Yes, the Beastie Boys have that song, No Sleep Till Brooklyn. Exactly. Is, no Sleep Till the Fifth Floor. That's so right, exactly. But it's, yeah, for me, it's just so exciting to watch, to think about how much change we're going to have. We've talked a little bit about, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about even the at large seats. There are, you know, two open seats, and we have a lot of candidates uh, out there right now, a lot of good qualified candidates. We clearly have two incumbents. Uh, Council President Murphy and Councilor Ayanna Presley, who um, should be okay because they're incumbents. If you go by that that school of thought, that if you're an incumbent and that's next to your name, that's you know counts for something. Um, but really, because this race with, between the mayor's race and the at-large race is so there are so many people, it could go any number of ways. Do you have any thoughts on how you think that the final eight might end up? 
Well, I had the pleasure recently of hosting all of the candidates in Charlestown for a forum mm -hmm. uh, that we had at our Knights of Columbus. And it was a challenge, uh, I think, as you mentioned a little earlier, um, to get the message out with okay. so many candidates going through uh, and moderating that evening. Um, it was a little difficult getting uh, to each candidate, um, uh, sort of getting to them and then giving them enough time to really have a chance. Uh, was it like a six-hour <laughs> well, six we, forum? We, we actually tried to, you know, we set up the time and, yeah. and actually had them restricted to sort of one-minute answers and two-minute answers. And, you know, that's not a lot of time, yeah. especially when you're uh, trying to sort of uh, break away from the pack and, and talk about a particular issue. But uh, I'm going to be very parochial. I'm very impressed by uh, Jack Kelly. He's worked extremely hard. Uh, I've been uh, following Marty uh, all over the city, parts of the city I didn't even know existed that I've <laughs> discovered. Um, but it's been, um, you know, I've seen his Jack's presence yep. in, in every part of that city. But and that's did, great for a first candidate that's running for the first time. But did Jack take you to FOMU on Center Street in Jamaica Plain or their location in Alston? Uh, he did not. Is that something that he should be doing? Well, uh, you know, I've been talking to all the candidates for at large. So if yes. you've missed any of the uh, candidates during any of the forums that have been going around the city, again, you can go to Facebook or our YouTube channel to, to listen and learn about those different candidates. But so for each candidate that has come on, I've talked about different parts of the city because like you just mentioned, you've been to parts of the city that you just had never been to before. And yes. so for a lot of the candidates, they maybe are traveling around to different parts of the city that they've never been to. Yes. So I've been asking them all if they've gone to FOMU, which is a uh, vegan ice cream place. There are two locations, like I mentioned, one in Jamaica Plain and one in Alston. Mm -hmm. And so that's usually my question for every person who's coming on. So you have well, not been there, and now have, you will uh, have to go. I have not been there, and uh, v vegan ice cream? Yeah, so it's made, it's okay. coconut milk based. Okay. So for people who are lactose intolerant or just don't like and cow's milk, they does can. It, does it taste good? It's delicious. Delicious. It okay. is delicious. I'm going to take your word for it and I'll have to check it out. You will definitely have to check it out. But anyway, you were talking about Jack Kelly. Yes, I think Jack has uh, been working very hard. He's been uh, in every part of the city that I have been with Marty. I've noticed a presence. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, He's also got great endorsements. Yes, he does. So. He's worked very hard. So I think that he is uh, uh, an individual that uh, folks should be paying attention to. Um, I also um, think that with uh, the entire slate of candidates, again, what I mentioned about the mayor's race, very impressed. A lot of very um, impressive individuals, uh, great backgrounds, great interest, great ideas in, uh, you know, in, in terms of moving the city forward, uh, exciting for the city. Same Very. with the mayor's race. And what's, I think, been difficult for them is most of the attention has been on the mayor's race, and it's hard for them to get attention in that type of environment. But um, everywhere, again, that I've been, I've, I've noticed that there's a, there's a race out there, and folks are working hard. Mm -hmm. um, I think for the final eight, uh, you're going to see some names that obviously are new mm -hmm. uh, to Boston politics, and then the challenge for them will be, obviously, to make it into that final four. And it's going to be an interesting time between now and November. Who do you think will be number one in the at-large ballot? If I was a betting person, which I'm not, <laughs> um, and you're going to hold me to this now. Well, now I'm going to ask you about the casino next. <laughs> uh, who do I think will top the ticket? Yeah. Citywide? Yeah. So last time I on a Presley topped the ticket. Yeah. So I'm going to have to uh, play safe and be parochial and say Jack Kelly's going to surprise everybody. Really? Yes. So right now, hopefully Jack is watching and he's uh, going to take this so. little his, clip and put it on his website. His dad is a good guy. <laughs> yeah. No, and Jack, you know, one of the things that, and I've said this before in the show, for a candidate like Jack, Catherine O'Neill, yes. uh, Ramon Soto, who's got yes. uh, experience in the Mission mayor's Hill. office, yes. they and Ramon was not a neighborhood coordinator, but Catherine and Jack were both neighborhood coordinators, which other than being elected and... Prepares you for... Yeah, right, yeah, it prepares absolutely. you because you're out there 24-7, you're working with people in the community. Um, so it, it's that opportunity to then, if you're putting your name on the ballot, it's sort of an easy transition if you make it to the final four because you know the job. I completely agree, apart from maybe legislatively and some other right. functions, for the most part, uh, constituent services and, and the like, you're, you're, you're doing uh, the majority of that work. Right, absolutely. So you mentioned the mentioned gambling, so yes. now I'm going to have to ask you about the casino. Yes. So do you think there should be a citywide vote or just an East Boston vote? Uh, I think that there should be an East Boston vote. Um, I have uh, driven um, over to West Roxbury and other parts of the city, um, and uh, no offense to the distance, but uh, it's quite a distance from the State House. If right. I get caught at one red light, 
it may take me 12 minutes to get to the state house, but normally I can be at the state house in 10 minutes um, from where I live. So uh, I really think that uh, that issue was vetted in the legislature, uh, and uh, the senator and the representative from that district, where uh, most folks in the Boston area automatically assumed. Uh, even knowing that there would be a competitive process for a license, mm -hmm. um, most folks assume that it will go to Suffolk Downs. Right. And that's why the issue focused on East Boston legislatively. Nobody, I can tell you, imagined that a billionaire would parachute into Everett and have a proposal on the table uh, that, you know, took everybody by surprise, mm -hmm. received 83% of the vote in Everett by the people to allow it well, to be there. Yeah, um, he worked very hard to get that vote, from what did, I understand. He did, negotiated an agreement yeah. with uh, the mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it was surprising uh, to all of us, especially me being the representative right. representing Charlestown, and this right. is going to be on our doorstep, and right. that's a whole other complicated issue that perhaps we could devote a whole show <laughs> know, to uh, at some point. But um, I do think that it should be an East Boston vote because that is the neighborhood that will be most impacted by this. The surrounding communities under the state legislation are entitled to negotiate mitigation agreements mm -hmm. and with the municipal leaders mm -hmm. and with input from the community. And hopefully that's uh, something that will happen. Do you think? I know it's already happened, but something going forward will be honored. Right. Do you think, though, that having something like a casino basically in the middle of a city is the right thing to do or you know if you look at foxwoods and mohegan they're they're out in the middle of nowhere essentially if you go to vegas i mean mm -hmm. vegas was built for casinos and casinos only it's only because mm -hmm. uh, it became a desirable place to live that more and more houses and people are living there and working there mm -hmm. but do you think it's a casino is something that's appropriate for city living, if you will? Well, I think a casino is just one part of development. Obviously, you cannot put all of your eggs in one basket. And certainly here in the Boston area, in the greater Boston area, in Massachusetts in totality, um, we have uh, an economy that is not going to be heavily uh, reliant on input from the casinos. We will take, the Commonwealth will take the revenue that is generated. Um, we do appreciate the jobs that will be created. And quite frankly, I think the recession that occurred, the worst uh, recession that Massachusetts found herself in since the Great Depression, uh, and with the amount of individuals that were out of jobs, in particular in the trades and the mm -hmm. industry, um, that it made it easier for folks uh, to reconsider, even if they opposed uh, casinos or right. gambling, in essence, uh, based on the economic development arguments that were proffered. Um, and given the recession and the timeliness of that, it made it uh, a far easier discussion, I think, uh, to have. So I don't think anybody anticipated that casinos would be relied upon incredibly. Um, right. But I do think that uh, they are one part of economic development. I myself would not rely on them mm -hmm. uh, terribly. Um, right. I do think that Boston has an innovative and creative and dynamic economy that because of MIT and Harvard and the spin-offs and the biotech industries and mm -hmm and all of that, that uh, that is where we get our uh, economic strength from and our vitality. That is where pre-recession, uh, post-recession, you're now seeing the jobs restored. Mm -hmm. uh, in manufacturing, you start light manufacturing that we have in Massachusetts, right. which is still substantial. Uh, right. We're starting to see the jobs restored there. So while I do think that it will generate revenue, uh, I don't think anybody, uh, especially at least uh, in the state house, is relying on it to uh, solve our economic problems. Right, exactly. And I will say, just speaking of development, there's a lot of economic development happening here in, in the city now, which is, yes. is great to see. I mean, Dudley Square, there's stuff going on. Downtown Boston now we have stuff going on. And so it's nice to see that after so long of not really seeing anything happening, um, except for maybe at some of the colleges and universities, we're starting to see stuff there seems sprout to be, up. There seems to be cranes everywhere, right. and that is great for the economy. Horrible um, for driving, though. It is, uh, <laughs> but we all experience that. But I, I do think that uh, given the recession, given the fact that we did uh, better than most of our sister states, yes. uh, we had a rainy day account to deal, uh, set up by the legislature uh, yep. to deal um, with that economic downturn. Um, we have fared very well in Massachusetts comparatively to, to our, our other states. And that is, um, there's no secret to that. It was, it was because of some, some foresight and some work and uh, the diligence to, uh, to stick to budgets that uh, you know, we created on time and kept try to keep within uh, a certain capacity. Um, and the next CEO of Boston um, will have to deal with a lot of those same challenges. And, I think the legislature has been great training for my candidate, Marty Walsh, in particular because he has been there in the good times, mm -hmm. he has been there in the bad times, yeah. 
He has witnessed uh, the Commonwealth uh, firsthand as to uh, maybe some things that we could have done better uh, during the sort of uh, days when we were in the recession. Um, so I think that that's been a great uh, learning experience and something that will uh, make him qualified day one. So you obviously want Marty to come in, in uh, next week in one of the top two spots. Who do you think is going to come in alongside him? Well, uh, I know that the polls are sort of all over the place, <laughs> yeah. and I had an opportunity to listen to your previous guest. Yeah. And I thought I heard him say, if my memory serves me correct, that uh, all of the polls are within four points mm -hmm. uh, margin of yep. error. Um, if that young gentleman was correct, and I hope he is, <laughs> um, I think that uh, it's not fair for anybody to say that they're either in the lead uh, right. or that they're number three or that they're number four. Thank you. I agree. Um, I would that. There I, is one thing that I do know. Yeah. I do know that next Tuesday is going to be an incredible get out the vote operation mm -hmm. by all of the candidates. Yep. I'm, in, I'm, I'm very biased. I feel that my candidate has the best get out the vote operation, mm -hmm. and I think he will be the first to tell you that uh, the poll that counts is uh, the election was also going to happen the night of the 24th. Right, absolutely. And as I was saying to James when he was here, anything can happen next Tuesday. I, didn't, I haven't looked ahead to see what the weather prediction is, but if it's yes. a rainy day, that's going to impact things. If it's a yes. beautiful day like today was, that will be helpful. There's just so many things that will come into play on election day. And there are also people, frankly, who might be telling a candidate, oh, yes, I'm with you, but really they're with, you know, Marty or yes. Rob or yes. Charlotte or somebody else. But... You just have no idea where people are going to be. And because that margin of error is so close, I agree with you that people who are, I think it's great for them morale-wise, building you know their, their bases to say, yes, we're coming in here, we're coming in he there. But it's a little misleading because it doesn't really mean anything at the end of the day. I completely agree. I think polls serve a purpose. I think they right. do provide some guidance, but certainly I don't think that they're the, uh, the final say. The final say are the people that vote. And I do think that any candidate um, should plan for a rainy day. <laughs> yes. um, I don't, uh, you know, most election days that I can recall it, it, for some reason in my mind, it always seems to be raining. So, or freezing uh, cold. Get, get, the, uh, get the raincoats and the umbrellas. Yep, absolutely. And then I think that, uh, I mean, you're right, it's a matter of who has the best ground game and who has the bodies to get people to the polls, um, who's working those phones, again, starting from tomorrow until yes. Tuesday at 8 p.m. because polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Tuesday, yes. um, and making sure that those people are going out there and voting. That's it, and I do think that there's a small pool that is shrinking every day of undecideds, and undecideds uh, for a whole host of various reasons are looking at the candidates. They're looking for maybe that one particular issue that's important to them. Right. It could be bike pathways. It could be you know, what we're going to do with the geese uh, somewhere, <laughs> whatever it may be, uh, yeah. there is uh, quite possibly an issue that they're looking uh, to right. find out about a candidate. So um, it's still a wonderful opportunity mm -hmm. between now and Tuesday at 8 o'clock, literally. Yeah. Um, you know, you can convince somebody at 7.30 on Tuesday night yep. uh, that your candidate is the right person, and we're going to be working right up until that point. And David was talking in my ear. He's telling me that it's going to be 63. It's going to be sunny but cold on yeah. Tuesday, so uh, people have to bundle up. I will believe it. It when I see it. I know, right? Exactly. <laughs> I think uh, that's probably the worst uh, worst prediction is to have like a cold. The sunny rainy. part. The I'm sunny? not saying the 63 yeah. part. Um, I just every election day is always rainy to me. Exactly. I think too you're going to have some some voters, um, maybe older voters who are going to be a little bit confused with how many candidates number one are on the ballot, but also um, we have two candidates who have similar sounding names if you're just speaking them and that's of course Dan Conley and John Conley mm -hmm. and people might get into the, the into the booth and not really remember which is which mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so again anything can happen and things like that if I people are counting on certain votes they might yes, not be getting them I agree and I think uh, the public um, I think is uh, anticipating that it will be a heavy turnout mm -hmm. and I think folks will be patient. Uh, folks that are standing in line are there for a reason um, yeah. and they will stay in line uh, yeah. until they vote. So I think um, we're going to see a, a large turnout and I think folks will be patient and at the end of the night um, we're going to have our results and, yes. uh, and then off to November. Exactly. So James was saying that he thinks there are going to be about 120,000. Yes. Um, do you agree with that? I assessment? think that that's uh, about right. I had an opportunity to listen to him, and I heard him say that and talk about the presidential race yeah. and uh, the last mayoral race. I think that that's what most folks are anticipating. Um, certainly folks are looking at around a 20, 25,000 uh, vote benchmark to try yeah. to make it into uh, the final two. 
Um, and I can tell you that certainly that's what my candidate is looking at as well. Yeah. Let's talk about the presidential race yes. versus a municipal race. Is yes. it surprising to you that so many people vote in a presidential but not in a city race? It's uh, not so much surprising to me. I think obviously a presidential race uh, captures their attention in far more ways uh, in terms of the mediums that reach them. Uh, so it's far more prominent uh, nationally. Um, uh, and obviously, uh, you know, it's a presidential race brings with it its own dynamic uh, right. oftentimes. Um, the municipal election I have over the years being in, sort of involved in my own elections, I've noticed that there are some folks uh, that will vote every election. There are some folks, me. Um, that's me too, <laughs> there are some folks that uh, will only vote in state elections. Yep. And, um, you know, there are some instances where my district is so small, I actually know the folks that, um, that fall into those categories. <laughs> and um, if you ask them, oftentimes they have various reasons. Oh, yeah. um, some of them uh, are only interested uh, oftentimes in state elections or vice versa. Right. They're only interested in city elections. Right. Uh, so, you know, every person has their own uh, unique reasoning behind right. why they do what they do. Uh, our job, I think, as folks that are in the public square and are interested in creating civic engagement, encouraging more people to participate, are always looking for ways uh, to increase that. Um, some of the ideas that I heard discussed a little earlier of merging dates, I'm not so sure if I'm in favor of that, and no. I'll tell you why. I think that a presidential race brings with it some very discrete issues that are very different than municipal elections and very, very different than municipal races, and I think that folks need to in today's day and age especially when we're constantly bombarded with uh, so many different um, things that are trying to grab our attention um, that it is important to focus exclusively on national issues in a presidential race and, and, mm -hmm. and well so and you, that's a good point because certainly um, there have been uh, candidates on this program before who are running and they'll talk about issues that really have nothing to do with the city this as a candidate uh, who was running for city council mm -hmm. um, that have nothing to do with the work of a city councilor. Um, so I think you're right, it might confuse people to the extent that they're wondering why their representative isn't acting on a certain issue when that's not really in your purview to be acting in that manner. Yes, and oftentimes a constituent uh, will call our office and uh, they will call on a federal issue uh, right. oftentimes or a, uh, obviously a state issue, uh, sometimes a municipal issue. And you know, we don't tell them, call your congressman or call, right. you know, we take care of it you, for yeah. them. But that's part of the role, I think, is is um, is not only the population educating you as, as an elected official as to what their positions are and their sentiments and how they feel about issues, but you also educating and participating um, in letting them know about where they can direct their ideas and where they can direct their opinions and mm -hmm. that will be most appropriate and have the most effect. Right. And, uh, you know, in this mayoral race that we're in right now, I think that you're uh, starting to see more people pay attention mm -hmm. and there's only a couple of days left. Uh, it always boils down to this, doesn't it? It's yeah. the last few days. There is still a pool of undecideds and all of the candidates are trying to uh, convince them to vote for them. Are you shocked that there are so many undecideds? I mean, it's, uh, it's around 36% I think of undecided voters, maybe even a little higher. Uh, I think that a lot of folks are uh, still wondering if it's true that the mayor is leaving. Right, right. Uh, so, it's 40%, by the way. Yeah, so that, uh, I think there's a little bit of that. I think right. that there's a little reluctance by some to uh, focus attention right. on something where it's been in place for so long, and I think that that changed the anxiety that's created by that oftentimes. Um, but I do think that the flip side of that is that it is good mm -hmm. for the city to have that infusion of ideas. Right. Change is always good. Um, when I first started out, it was give a young guy a chance. <laughs> um, now it's experience counts. Yep, yep. Um, but I, th I do think that uh, an infusion of ideas uh, is, is great for the city, and I think this is a wonderful election. Yeah, and it's been great to hear all the different ideas from the different candidates. So, um, you know, whoever becomes next mayor might go back and look at some of the candidates that they were running against and say, oh, I, I uh, want this person absolutely, to come into my administration. As a matter of fact, I think Marty Walsh has already stated, um, as a matter of fact, just the other day, I mm -hmm. believe he stated that he has heard uh, some good ideas on the campaign trail. So yeah. if uh, we're fortunate enough and the people uh, have enough faith in my candidate, Marty Walsh, uh, to elect him mayor, I do think you will see him uh, involving people uh, that have been involved in this race and asking them for their ideas because at the end of the day, um, what I think is common amongst all the candidates is that everyone is looking for 
uh, a better Boston. Mm -hmm. We're looking to improve what has been left us. Yeah. And what has been left us is a wonderful jewel and a wonderful gift uh, that through whatever criticisms people may make, our mayor has done an outstanding job, has brought Boston into the 21st century, and the next mayor will have the incredible challenge of continuing that wonderful journey. And uh, obviously I'm hoping that it's my candidate that gets to lead the city in that direction. I'm hoping that that's the case. But whatever candidate uh, wins, I think all of them are looking for the same thing, which is a better Boston, a brighter future. And at the end of the day, that's what we're all involved in public service for. Absolutely. We're going to end on that note. I want to thank okay. you so much for being here today. Great. Thanks for Talk about the me. race. Talk about yeah. your um, candidate. Yes. And we'll definitely have you back because thank you. Please. This is, uh, yes. it's been great to have you. First time here. And yes. You have a lot to say, and I, I like feel, to talk. I feel like so. I'm at home. This I know, right? Great. So it's good. Next time we'll, you know, make it a little longer. Maybe okay. we'll have you on the whole hour. Sounds great. Thank you. <laughs> so just to remind people, next Tuesday, September 24th, is when you go to the polls. They are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Again, if you have any questions about the different mayoral candidates or the at-large candidates, you can go onto the Facebook page or our YouTube page to watch the watch the uh, videos of the different shows that we've done over the past few months to learn a little bit more about the candidates. And again, go out and vote. I want to thank the crew behind the scenes here today for putting together a great show. We'll see you next time.